How's it going everybody? One of my highly recommended items in the Ham Shack, whether you're experienced or just starting out, is the ARRL Handbook. And today I'm going to be going through one of my favorite sections, which is Volume 5, Chapter 24, setting up your Ham Shack, going mobile, and going portable. Let's take a look. Thanks to Steve K5ATA for kicking all of this off. There will be links in on the description of this video for all the channels involved, but there's a playlist, which will also be linked, which will take you to all of the topics, discussions, and chapter discussions that we covered today with our own individual opinions on our favorite sections. Now, this is an overarching comment on the ARRL Amateur Radio Handbook in general, that most of the sections are ones that you can pick up at any time as a reference and then sort of find what you're looking for and get about your day. There are mathematical equations for setting up antennas, knowing different types of antennas and homebrew projects, understanding different types of circuits, and operating your radio. But I like chapter 24 for everyone that is kind of new to ham radio that is thinking about setting up their home shack because if read in linear order, meaning from top to bottom, you walk through not just what it is to set up an amateur radio station, but the thoughts that you should consider when starting out for the first time and also, before you actually put down a radio or anything else, the things to consider before you get started. So the first major point that I really like, that's one of my favorite things to mention when people are setting up something at home, is to make sure you consider exactly what your goals are and have a visual layout or a mental image in your head about what you are going to attempt to do. For people starting out, that could be kind of difficult. What do you mean? Am I going to do HF only, or, or maybe I'm only a technician now, and HF may not be something I'm going to be interested in later, or I'm just going to have a VHF, UHF radio, or maybe I just have a handheld. So the thoughts of all of that should go into your head. Perhaps even consider drawing a picture of your space and kind of having a methodology of where you're going, what it's going to look like as you go along, potentially building boxes upon boxes as you build out your shack, as you go from technician, general, and to extra. Now, I think most would agree, and, and the ARRL handbook here definitely also agrees, that no situation or station can be absolutely perfect. Sure, there's examples of people who have just the best stations ever that we all drool over when we see pictures of them online. But a lot of the times you're going to have to make do with what you can. And the book makes an incredible point of mentioning that you need to, before you do anything, make sure that you're going to have a good, adequate power supply to where you are going to connect radios. Potentially even going so far as to have a professional come out and check the circuitry and to check your circuit breaker. As long with that, you should also check that you have good grounding to your outlets and that you have the ability to reach them and set up good grounding for your amateur radio station. Grounding is something you don't want to forget. Yes, of course, grounding is very important, and the book talks about that. Now, because this isn't just a box that you're going to put in a closet somewhere, meaning your radio, you're likely going to also have to interface it with other things like computers and also have a direct connection to the outside for antennas to come in. And you should definitely consider how you're going to get your coax in and out and potentially what's on the other side of that wall. These are all things that are talked about in this book and why it's important to consider this up front. Now the handbook in a couple of pages right in the beginning of chapter 24 talk about the importance of grounding, which I've already talked about, but it goes into greater detail of breaking that down into your RF safety ground, your lightning protection, and then RF management, which includes the electromagnetic radiation that all electronic devices in and around your radio is going to give off and how you potentially mitigate any noise that comes up when you want to operate radio. Trust me, if you do this work up front, it's going to save a lot of pain on the back end when you have to disassemble your entire shack to lay out appropriate grounding or put up a ground bar that this book talks about uh, to appropriately create a ground situation where you will both be safe, protected from lightning, and mitigate potential RFI issues with electric devices or electronic devices. Now this book is full of images that are very helpful in understanding what this is all about, particularly when it comes to grounding, like Ward Silver. N0AX provides great images of what a potential ground plane situation looks like, which can be done with aluminum roofing flashing, 
or copper sheets, and even flattened copper pipes to make a ground bus bar that you would use to connect devices to. It's incredibly important that you consider what needs to go under your equipment before you lay said equipment on top of it. Now, when it comes to the arrangement of your devices, your radios, your computers, if you have a tuner or an antenna rotor or something along those lines, if this is the first time you're doing it, you're likely gonna have preconceived notions of what you think or how you think things should be set up, which is fine. You, you should kind of go in the direction you think is gonna be most effective to you. But the book states, and I also recommend, having things within control that you can physically reach out and touch without having to do a lot of straining to reach any one way or another. This is gonna be a place that you're gonna be sitting in front of for a long amount of times in some cases if you participate in contests or weekend events. So you'll definitely want to save the strain by making sure the things that you most use are in ready available space for you to use and manipulate and do whatever it is you do. Now, one of the big takeaways that I think you can get from this book in the words and in the images is what the space you think you need is likely smaller than you actually need. There is a very real world of devices that you're gonna collect along your ham radio journey most likely. I know some people can get away with a very Spartan shack and that's awesome. I think that's great. I'm not taking anything away from that. But you will find yourself eventually collecting shelves and stacking devices on top of each other. And all of these considerations that you do in the front end of building your shack is going to pay dividends on the back end. I promise. Now as you're reading through the handbook and if you start with chapter 24 along with me, uh, doing this video, you will see that there are grayed out boxes of key points that are specifically important or deserve their own special reference. And one of those items for building your own ham shack is have a fire extinguisher in your shack. In this case, it makes special note of a ABC type fire extinguisher that sends out powder that is non-conductive to electronics. So most likely you shouldn't have a problem if you had to deploy one of these in your shack. Everybody should have a fire extinguisher. If they don't, I highly recommend it. And this book makes special note of it, so consider it. All right, let's flip this around and talk about mobile installations. Mobile installations are actually something that is relatively straightforward, but there are some things to remember that the book calls out very like prominently upfront that you should consider. One of the big things is if it's not bolted down and you get into an accident, that becomes a missile for whomever is in your car, if not yourself. And that includes any pathway of your airbag. Make sure there isn't a head unit on a little mobile mount arm or something like that that could get in the way. Now getting the easy stuff out of the way first, and, and yes, it's actually an easier part of this whole uh, shack setup set in your mobile, is that using RG58 or RG8X coax, something that is like this, a bit more flexible and bendable, is something that's gonna be a lot easier to route around. Now, because this is a mobile installation, you will have power cords likely leading back to the battery. And the book makes an incredible point, an important point of noting that they need to be abrasion resistant, chemical resistant, and heat resistant, particularly if you have an internal combustion engine your engine compartment gets extremely hot and making sure that you're using the right equipment and keeping those wires away from the potential heat sources is going to be very important. Also, make sure you stick with those fuse connectors. You want them connected on those wires wherever possible on your radio. That will save major problems in the future if you do have a short or something where that fuse could end up saving the day. Now there are a bunch of amazing images that you should definitely check out for going through and working around body panels and final installations. There are many amazing radios on the market that have detachable head units that can be separated from the body and placed in prominent display, again, away from airbags using many different versions of mobile mount systems. In my car, I use something called a Lido mount and Lido mounts generally make a good rigid connection and are pretty firm for running radio head units and control solutions. Now, speaking of power, after I just got done saying, you know, you wanna to connect to the battery, there's actually a really, again, prominent gray box section that talks about battery connections and cars that have electronic load detectors. This is a situation for you all that have cars where when you go to idle, the engine shuts off. And then when you start again, it starts back up those could actually play some kind of effect and havoc on your ham radio. So the suggestion is 
make sure you connect to the positive lead and the negative lead goes to the chassis ground. That is oftentimes right by your car's 12 volt battery. So keep an eye out for that and that's where you wanna tap into it. Again, now the handbook mentions it and I definitely recommend it. Go to k0bg.com and there are a wealth of articles about all things from bonding your components within your radio station to your car, as well as running HF amplifiers or just power amplifiers in general. Now, mobile installations are something that is particularly near and dear to my heart, uh, particularly on the HF side. I have an electric vehicle that I drive for commuting to and from work. And when I first started out, I had all kinds of issues with noise. I actually went to k0bg.com as well as referenced my handbook. And I quickly learned that the trick for all of this is bonding. Bond all the things. Yes, bonding. Bonding is the interconnect or connecting electrically all the exterior panels, the doors, the hood, your trunk, your hatch lid, if you have one, they all connect to the chassis. If you are uh, a truck owner, you likely will need to bond the frame to the cab because sometimes it's just cab on frame and they don't have a great electrical connection. Same if you have a big exhaust system that needs to have a good electrical bond to the frame and so on. This is sometimes a lot of work, but it pays dividends on the back end. I promise you. Okay, the last section in chapter 24 is your portable station. And this is taking your equipment outdoors and playing radio. This has a ton of pros. One of the main one is that likely wherever you're going will have a much lower noise floor than your ham shack, particularly if you're like me and live in the suburbs. I will note upfront that the handbook in this case is likely talking more towards those of you that would be participating in field day or longer portable operations, potentially weekend long events, or maybe like a weekend long vacation type event where you may have one or more operators. In fact, one of the first portions of this section of the chapter is talking about AC power solutions and using generators and the appropriate generators to look for. Should you look for a traditional stator generator or a generator that uses an inverter? And then once you have those devices, how do you interconnect your radios to them to supply the much needed power, but in a way that doesn't create radio frequency interference. This part of the chapter goes so far into showing you how to set up a custom RF choke using two cheaply available home plugs. It's pretty smart. It uses a toroid and some Romex wires that are wrapped around it multiple times that connect to the two plugs. So you provide power to both plugs for interconnecting different devices and it acts as an RF choke somewhere in between your generator and your radio. Now, of course, a section like portable radio is going to talk about antennas. And who oh boy, everybody who likes portable radios, our favorite thing is setting up that antenna. But the handbook has to be a fuddy-duddy, I guess. Fuddy-duddy? And talk about grounding. And yeah, you should consider grounding. And to be clear, this is gonna be talking about grounding for both your generator and your antenna. You should consider doing both things. While some of the images in the handbook definitely have antennas that would make any ham drool, there are a couple of really quick antennas and simple antennas that you can think about deploying for your next portable operation, like the tire rollover antenna mast support. It's just a bunch of pieces of metal that make a right angle with a pole holder that you put your antenna mast into. You roll your car over the top of it or truck and you've got a really solid mount for putting up an antenna. So that's chapter 24 in a nutshell. You really should get the handbook just so that you can go into greater detail, obviously well beyond this particular chapter, but this provides a wealth of knowledge that I think every new ham and even hams who have already set up a station, a mobile or portable outdoor operation setup could find useful. Stay tuned because Temporary Offline is following me and he's gonna be talking about digital modes, another one of my big favorites. And again, thank you to the ARRL for setting all of this up. They did send me this handbook for me to take a look at. Uh, I have bought a couple of different versions of this handbook over the years and have been gifted handbooks. It changes over the years as it is updated and modified and improved with more pictures by different editors and people that are providing new content that they come up with every year. So there are always some reason to check out what is new and interesting. I personally like these smaller ones that come in 
many different uh, sizes, but basically it breaks the handbook down into something where you can just grab the one and take that along with you for the project you're doing instead of having the large tome in front of you. But there's nothing wrong with that either, and they provide both. So links are in the description where you can go get your own handbook. It helps obviously to support the ARRL and is a wealth of information. Well, thank you so much for watching the Ham Radio Crash Course. Again, I am Josh, KI6NAZ. If you found this video helpful, consider giving me a thumbs up and subscribing because I live stream every Saturday, 5 p.m. Pacific Standard Time and every other Wednesday at 6 p.m. Pacific Standard Time for Ham Nation. Thanks so much, and I'll talk to you later. 73. 73. For your next portable apparition. Uh, for your next portable apparition. Uh, oh,